The best range of building heights for a sustainable city is four to five floors, one for shared amenities, two to three for residences, plus a rooftop garden. In this episode, we'll explore how energy use, crop yields, economics, and aesthetics combine to create this sweet spot for building heights. Welcome to Edenicity, best practices for sustainably abundant cities. Just as a quick review, the reason Edenicity does not use detached homes is because detached homes have terrible physics. They have a terrible surface area to volume ratio, and so they tend to waste energy. They cost a lot to heat and cool. They also waste land, and that's basically the prime directive of Edenicity is to reduce our land use, so that's a no-no. They tend to be car dependent, and on the social front, they atomize people. I first heard this phrase from the Adam Something channel, see the link in the description, but that word actually first crossed my mind years ago while driving through some suburbs, and block after block, mile after mile, nobody was out on the streets. You had all these beautiful yards and sidewalks, and there wasn't a soul around. People were all inside or driving around, completely cut off from one another, not interacting with each other, like little atoms. So what does Edenicity do instead of using detached homes? Edenicity is an effortlessly sustainable, multifamily, mixed use, mixed income, car-free, transit-oriented, energy and food secure city. But notice that the buildings are not especially tall. Why is that? I mean, why is Edenicity not high-rise? Now true, high rises use higher energy materials such as stainless steel to a much greater extent than lower rise buildings. But these higher energy materials and their environmental and financial costs are frequently offset in many ways. The price of land and the land use is divided by many, many more units. And even at their higher cost per square meter, apartments tend to be smaller, tend to have fewer square meters than detached houses. This is often the opposite of a hardship because in multifamily dwellings, including high rises, you're closer to shared amenities, co-working, conference rooms, gyms, and so forth. So your apartment can be that much smaller. Smaller also means that it's cheaper and easier to furnish, clean, and maintain. But keep those higher construction costs in mind. We'll need them later. Well, if Edenicity is not detached homes and it's not high rises, then maybe it's that awful in between, the notorious big dumb box. I have to admit, my drawings do look a little bit boxy, but a recent episode by Type Ashton came to my rescue. She did a recent video on big dumb box buildings in Germany, singing their praises as low carbon, durable, and affordable. Easy to build, easy to insulate, and easy to maintain. Big dumb boxes are also very convenient for storing your belongings because the spaces are usually orderly, squared off, and easily fit our possessions. But as a viewer commented in my last video, big dumb boxes also come off as a little bit sterile and tend to lack character. I'm planning a deep dive on building form for the next episode, including alternatives to the box and their many social implications. But for clarity today, I will stick with more or less a box. I'll be using this reference design, which you can download from the description. Now, the first thought that came to mind when I thought of a simple box was, how can we put these big flat roofs to use? This is an example of the ecological principle of stacked functions that I mentioned in the last episode. Of course, a roof keeps you comfortable and dry, but what else can it do? Well, you can use a roof for energy with solar power or wind, and you can also use that roof for plantings. Green roofs are becoming popular throughout the world, and the many hundreds of green roofs planted in Chicago have been studied in depth and demonstrated that they're great for climate mitigation. Chicago's green roofs were up to 19 degrees Celsius, or 34 degrees Fahrenheit, cooler in summer, and they had some insulating effect in winter. Now, for those of you who are worried about growing plants on your roof and what that might do to the durability of the roof. Paradoxically, green roofs have been shown to extend the lifetime of roof materials. Okay, so if one of our best options is to plant a green roof, why not take it a step further and grow food? Now, I want to make clear that growing food on the roof is not the same as vertical farms or high-rise farms. Let me break that down. You may have seen these container farms made by Square Roots Farms. These are completely enclosed environments built in shipping containers that provide the plants with everything they need to grow, including light from overhead LED lighting and fertilizer through a hydroponic growing medium. 
Their main claim to fame is that they're very water efficient, typically using about eight gallons a day to grow about 200 pounds of greens per month in 350 square feet of space. This works out to about 6.8 pounds per square foot, which is much better than you would do in open field agriculture raising greens. But when you compare it to high intensity raised bed gardening, where you're growing not just greens, but root veggies, potatoes, yams, carrots, radish, beets, as well as squash, beans, pumpkins, tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, you find that the yield is only about two to three times better. But in a raised bed, you're getting your energy for free from the sun. How does that compare to the energy budget for growing greens in shipping containers? In 2018, Square Roots spent about $600 a month on electricity, which at 20 cents per kilowatt hour works out to 100 kilowatt hours per day. A typical solar panel produces one kilowatt hour a day, so you would need about 100 solar panels or 1,600 square Square feet of solar panels to produce that amount of energy every day. That works out to four and a half times the roof area of the shipping containers. The moral of the story is, at least for now, use sunlight and soil rather than LEDs. This is the first reason why Edenicity doesn't have skyscraper farms. The second reason is that it costs maybe $10 to prepare a square meter for gardening in the open field and not too many times that to prepare a container garden of the kind that you would have on a roof. But if you're building a high rise and putting in intensive lighting and machinery on every floor, you're looking at costs of about $3,000 per square meter. So even setting aside the energy consideration, vertical farming is hundreds of times less economical. So why should we even bother using rooftops at all? Well, you need to use a roof anyway. It's there, and in the case of the big dumb box and a couple other designs we'll get into next time, it's flat and very convenient to stack functions on, especially in a mixed use environment where downstairs it's likely as not that you'll have a cafe. If not in that building, then almost certainly a very nearby building. So if you grow on the roof, your growing activity happens really close to where the food is actually prepared and consumed. I can tell you as a former market gardener, this is a really big deal because the dirty little secret of farmer's markets is that they're not very efficient for a lot of people. Unless you have an easily stored crop such as garlic, many produce growers find that they have to donate several tens of percent of what they bring to market to food banks at the end of the day. But on the other hand, if your garden is right there next to the restaurant and you interoperate it with the restaurant, then you can conduct your restaurant menu planning in tandem with the planting schedule and with the seasons and have incredibly fresh food and deliver it in a relatively predictable and economical way. Now in the original podcast, Podcast, I had suggested that Edenicity would use aquaponics on the roofs. I now think that a soil-based system would be better. It's much lower energy. There's no noisy pumps to disturb everybody. Much less material to maintain and possibly discard. The only downside is that a soil-based system almost certainly would have a significantly lower yield than aquaponic systems. Now on the topic of yield, you might be thinking that the small scale of a rooftop farm would not be able to compete against industrial agriculture, but the exact opposite is the case. According to the U.S. Agricultural census of 1992, small-scale farms had two to ten times higher yields per acre and up to a hundred times higher yield for the very smallest farms. How is this possible? How can people using very low-tech equipment, often just hand tools, outperform giant combines in the machinery of industry? Well, in the omnivore's dilemma, Michael Pollan has made the case that the two are optimized for different things. The small farm is optimized for a high yield in a small area and also high diversity, and for minimizing labor and materials on the small scale. But perhaps the biggest area where small-scale organic agriculture has been proven to thrive is when small-scale farmers and gardeners use interplanted crops. For example, greens can thrive in the summer in the shade of bean poles and cucumbers on trellises. The idea behind interplantings is that you may get sometimes slightly lower yields per crop on a given plot of land, but when you add up all the different crops that are growing there, the combined yield is much higher. And I can certainly vouch for this from experience. There's all kinds of nice little synergies. Interplanting onions with lettuce, basil with tomatoes, all tended to resist pests and provide just as much of each crop on the same plot of land as you would get if you planted them separately. A couple more things that small farmers routinely do is grow seedlings and then transplant them into the field. Mixing annuals and perennials, which is much more common in the warmer climates, and also intensive plant animal interactions, such as Joel Salatin has demonstrated for decades now in his pastures. Now, in my experience, when I have discussed rooftop gardening with people, the first thing that they say is, oh, these would be community gardens. This would be wonderful. And I have to caution you, 
that this is not the way to get a good yield. If you want a good yield, you need professional gardeners and farmers up there on the roof. You do not want this to be an everybody pitches in kind of thing where we're all just doing this communally. I have worked so much with community gardens and people don't have the discipline or the know-how to really get the good yield. The learning curve to getting a commercially viable yield is significant. I'll give you just a quick example. A lot of times when people go to weed a garden and you have a complex system of interplantings like we just discussed. A novice gardener will not know which plants are weeds and which plants are consumable. And this can get much more tricky than you would think if you're really being conscious of what you're doing. For example, if you have a bed of carrots, it's not uncommon in these parts for purslane uh, to become established. And purslane will get established in a very rapid and weedy way, but it's actually a, a delightful succulent that really adds to the quality of your greens. You could actually add it to salads in modest quantities and it's just wonderful stuff. A seasoned gardener will know to harvest the purslane, but not completely eradicate it and to not throw it away like a novice would. And the same goes for lamb's quarters. It's wonderful stuff. It's actually a quinoa. You can cook it up like broccoli and it will volunteer no matter what you do around here. With enough know-how, your core garden and cafe team will know not to throw these valuable gems away. Now, as I mentioned before, integrating the harvest with the cafe really builds efficiency. It's almost a factor of two increase in efficiency. When you have not only farm-to-table dining, but farm-to-table planning of plantings and menus in tandem. Mwah! such a great way to live. Now, when I looked into rooftop food gardens in big cities like Chicago, I was a little disappointed with the yields that they got. It looked to me like they were just basically direct sowing everything and just going with one or two crops a season and perhaps not interplanting and perhaps just going with single rows uh, and lots of space between the rows. I mean, their yields were you know, a few thousand pounds and a couple acres, but they could be a lot higher than that with intensive techniques. I believe that with season extension via shade cloth or greenhouse covers, buildings can not only greatly increase their yields, but they can also increase the already good effects of green roofs on climate control. Now, this is a pretty new field. There's not very many rooftop food gardens out there, and I can already see there's a lot of room for innovation. We can do with far better ergonomics, raised beds, small-scale on-site composting, modest automation, especially in transplanting, and perhaps maybe most ambitious would be finding some way to use the paths themselves as growing space when people are not occupied. Them. And again, I think with raised beds, some system of modest mechanical ingenuity could do that. Now, strangely enough, rooftop gardening sets a limit on building heights in Edenicity. This is because even with all of the limitations that I just mentioned, rooftop yields can be many times higher than field agriculture. So for every square meter of roof space that we lose, we have to add many more square meters to open field agriculture. And remember, our prime directive in Edenicity was what? Reduce our land use. So the paradox here is that if we build higher, we lose too much roof area per resident in the building and have to add to the overall footprint of Edenicity. The paradox then is building higher wastes more land. In most cases, two residential floors over one shared or commercial space is about right. And for bigger pricier apartments, you could maybe go to three residential floors in a building. Now it also turns out that for reasons I'll get into in a later episode, you need about two thirds as much commercial or workspace as residential in most cities. Now it's true that the industrial zones will account for a good chunk of this, and the ground floor areas will include both shared amenities and commercial space, and all of that counts as workspace. But even so, we'll need a few more floors and what that's going to mean is that in the village centers, town centers, regional centers, and city centers, you'll see a progression of increasingly tall buildings. There's probably no need to go to some insane height, like 100 stories, but there may be a few skyscrapers as you get in toward the city centers just to provide workspace. Now, I know some of this is changing with remote work, so a lot of this is to be determined. But even in these downtown areas, I'm picturing a certain number of residential units in nearly every building, and certainly green roofs on those buildings. So you might have, let's say, a 10-story building, two floors of which are residential, topped with a garden roof. Now, viewer Charlotte Eagles commented in the last video that three to four floors would provide a comfortable level of perceived enclosure for people on the street. This is exactly our sweet spot of three to four floors when you include ground floor shared in commercial spaces. The ecology of food production places a height limit of 
two to three residential floors on most buildings. For energy conservation, we don't want less than two residential floors. In the next episode, I'll talk about the ecology of building form, including apartments, townhouses, row houses, brownstones, and of course, the big dumb box. I'll be focusing on ecology as always, but let me know in the comments how you feel about building form, and especially building adornment, whether functional or decorative. Until then, take care, stay green, see you next time.